It is August 29th, 2017. We're here in Athens, Georgia. My name is Ashton Ellett, here with Tom Crawford of the Georgia Report. Um, Mr. Crawford is participating in our two-party Georgia oral history program, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Thank you for participating. Thank you for being Great. here. Um, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, mm -hmm. what, where you're from, what you've been doing, how mm -hmm. you've gotten to where you are. I was born and raised in Atlanta, one of the very few native Atlantans still around probably. Went to uh, journalism school here at the University of Georgia. Worked at several newspapers, including the Marietta Daily Journal and the Atlanta Journal. This was back in the days when you still had two newspapers in Atlanta. The Journal was an afternoon paper. I worked for them. And it, through working at both of those papers was when I got the opportunity to cover uh, the Georgia legislature in, uh, starting in 1974, actually. Later, I got uh, into online journalism uh, with my own new site, which is now called the Georgia Report, and it's now in its 18th year of covering uh, the state capitol and state government in general. So 1974. Um... It, now, was that at the, the, the Marietta Daily Journal? Yes, yes. I was a very young reporter at the Marietta Daily Journal, uh, all of 23 years old. Sent over to Atlanta to cover the uh, General Assembly session. 1974 was an interesting year because mm -hmm. you had several storylines inter intersecting then. It was the last year of Jimmy Carter as governor, the last year of Lester Maddox as lieutenant governor, and the first year of Tom Murphy as speaker. Mm -hmm. He had just been elected speaker when uh, George L. Smith passed away, and uh, he was sort of learning the ropes then as the new speaker of the House, although he very quickly figured out how to wield power and how to make things happen over there. So 1974 is also, of course, um, Watergate yes, climaxes. Watergate, um, Nixon's resignation. The Republican Party in Georgia had, from 1966 with Bo Calloway, mm -hmm. puts up a very strong campaign for governor. Yes, very strong. Loses um, by a fluke. Um, well, not by a fluke, more or less, but more of a quirk in our election law, similar to the Electoral College, if you will. Very fair. So 1970, um, with Hal Suit mm -hmm. um, and Jimmy Carter. Hal Suit is an amateur, but runs a relatively professional, above-board campaign. Yes. And then we get to 1974 with machine gun Ronnie Thompson. Mm -hmm. how, did we, how did the Republicans go from Bo Calloway and Hal Suit to, to machine gun Ronnie Thompson? Well, I think there was always a very conservative streak uh, among Republicans, especially those from outside the metro Atlanta area. So it wasn't very hard to see that happening. Uh, but it's interesting to look at the political landscape of 1974. I was in the General Assembly, and I remember there were four Republicans in the Senate out of 56, mm -hmm. maybe a dozen members of the House out of 180. You didn't have a single Republican congressman. You didn't have a single Republican statewide elected officer. I mean, that's as, I guess, as weak as one party can be, even in a one-party state like Georgia was at the time. And you wondered at that time if they were ever going to get their act together and, and become the dominant party, which, of course, they did. So you're, you're a Marietta Daily Journal sent mm -hmm. over to the AJC, Atlanta Journal or Atlanta, Constitution? Well, I worked after leaving the Marietta Daily Both Journal. Hand. <laughs> I worked for the Atlanta Journal. At that time, there was also a separate newspaper, the Atlanta Constitution. But I covered several legislative sessions and helped cover the Capitol for the Atlanta Journal back in the late 70s, early 80s. So who were some of the, the famed Atlanta political journalists there when you started working? Well, back then, uh, David Norton, of course, was uh, really one of the best. I mean, he was, he was a great political writer. Uh, I worked with him at the Journal. I mean, I don't claim to be anywhere near as good as he was. but. He had some um, personal shortcomings, but he was a, a great journalist and a hell of a writer. Mm -hmm. He really was. Uh, back then, I think back then you had Selby McCash at the Macon Telegraph, mm -hmm. another great political writer. Uh, Reg Murphy, who had been a good political writer at the Macon Telegraph, by that time in 1974 was the editorial page editor at the Atlanta Constitution. Was he the, the journalist who was kidnapped? Yes. He was kidnapped in, I think, 
late 1972. Mm. Released pretty quickly, but it uh, it was quite a sensation at the time. I remember coming across that one time and think that was the most bizarre thing in the world. It was pretty strange. It was pretty strange. Um, there was one other name I'm trying to think of here. Oh, and Bill Schiff, of course. Bill Schiff was writing about politics for the Atlanta Constitution then, and you know, Bill's one of a kind. Mm -hmm. He, he, I think, probably knew more about Georgia politicians maybe than anybody else who's come along. Uh, he eventually, like all of us, got older and retired, but in his time, he was a hell of a political mm -hmm. writer. He always knew how to unearth the big stories. Oh, yeah. So how, how did you, uh, or how or why, I suppose, did you make the transition out of the AJC into your own online publication? <laughs> Well, there was a period of about 17 years there where I got out of daily journalism. Okay. Uh, I did corporate speech writing, corporate public relations, uh, agency public relations, things like that. So I took a break from journalism for a, a, most of the 80s and the 90s. Then an opportunity came along to get back into journalism, only this time in an online forum, which is what the Georgia Report is. and. Uh, I got back into it and pretty soon found myself writing the same kinds of stories I wrote when I was a young kid in print journalism, only now for an online audience. So uh, there's a big hole in the middle there, but on either side, I was lucky enough to be able to cover Georgia politics. So how has political journalism um, changed since, since you got in the business in 1974 to 2017? Well, like the in newspaper industry in general, it's been shrinking. Um, at one time, you had a lot of people who would come to the to the state capitol and cover the general assembly sessions. Uh, the Columbus Ledger Enquirer would send somebody up. The Macon Telegraph would send somebody up. Even um, for a long time, the Chattanooga Free Press, mm -hmm. which covers has a lot of readership in Northwest Georgia, mm -hmm. they would send somebody down to cover. Uh, you had the Morris newspapers. They would have, at one time, they had three or four people in an Atlanta bureau who provided coverage for the Athens, Augusta, and Savannah papers. Mm. Uh, that's, of course, all, all gone now. Uh, today, it's, it's just not that many people covering the Capitol, which is a shame because it makes it easier for folks to hide stuff and get away with it when there are fewer people out there chasing the story. So, you know, what, what, what are some of your your earliest political memories in Georgia mm -hmm. sort of shaped your outlook on Georgia politics. Mm -hmm. Well, the, that first session I covered in 1974 was, it was a complete circus because uh, you had basic, you didn't have, it wasn't a case of Republicans versus Democrats, it was a case of Democrats versus Democrats. Okay. Uh, you had one faction <clears throat> of the Democrats in the legislature, they were the Maddox faction supportive of Lester Maddox, tended to be mostly, obviously, white legislators from rural districts. You had the Jimmy Carter Democrats, uh, who were always fighting with the Maddox Democrats. The Jimmy Carter Democrats, of course, were from Atlanta and the urban areas, included what few black legislators there were at the time. And at that time, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of your Republican legislators from Atlanta were more liberal than yeah. a lot of the Democrats mm -hmm. from the rural districts. Uh, certainly not that way anymore now. <laughs> but at that time, people like Paul Coverdell, Mike Egan, Kill Townsend, they actually, on issues and policy, were probably a little more liberal than most of the Democrats, mm. which, uh, of course, that has flip-flopped completely in the intervening 40 years. All right, def definitely Egan and Townsend. Do you mind if we stop for one sure, second? Sure, please, go ahead. Okay, so in 19... 82, David Norton, who you've mentioned, mm -hmm. he wrote an article for the Atlanta Magazine, once one of the, the big-time mm -hmm. movers and shakers in, yes. in political journalism, less so now. Mm -hmm. He said that the 1982 gubernatorial race marked the end of the Southern Gothic election in Georgia and mm -hmm. the South. What did he mean by that? Well, I'm not... David having passed on, uh, I'm not sure I can, I can speak for him and say what he meant by that. Sure. Here's what I think he meant. Okay. Uh, and, and, I, and I agree with him, by the way, okay. that 1982 was the last of the old traditional 
crisscross the state holding barbecues, line up <laughs> as many members of the legislature behind you as you can, uh, you know, play the race card, be as conservative outside Atlanta as you can. And uh, that really pretty much sums up the Joe Frank Harris Bogin race for governor that year, which was a nasty one. Mm -hmm. it, may, it made and it also broke a lot of careers. How, go ahead and elaborate on that, I've, well, other than Bogin, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, mine, for example. Oh. Uh, <laughs> well, no, tell. <laughs> no, we won't get into that. Uh, well, maybe we will. I mean, journal, I'm talking about journalistic careers because a lot of people I knew uh, got out of journalism after that because okay. they had run afoul of the Joe Frank Harris people and they figured it was time to get out and maybe do public relations work for a while. I was one, my good friend Charlie Hazlett was another. Um, and it happens. Uh, and of course, it was the end of Bo Ginn's career and poor Bo had a very bad end because he went to prison for a while and then uh, you know, wound up passing away, uh, which is a shame. He was a good guy, and for Georgia, a very progressive politician, but uh, that race just undid him. Now, we, when, when you say the, the Joe Frank crowd, were you, is that Tom Perdue? Yes, Tom yep. Perdue. Um, God, who was working for Joe Frank at the time? Tom Perdue, uh, Tom Daniel, who later went on to be a lobbyist for the University of Georgia and the university system. He was a big Joe Frank guy. Tommy Lewis who is now still working at Georgia State University is one of their uh, public affairs people, if you will. Uh, the uh, Barbara Morgan, who had been a journalist covering Joe Frank, went to work for Joe Frank uh, as, her, as his press secretary. Uh, some would argue she had really been his press secretary when she was <laughs> still covering the campaign as a news person, but be that as it may, there were a lot of uh, career paths that all of a sudden took different directions after that 1982 election. Okay, so why were Georgia Democrats able to hold on to power as long as they did here in the state? Well, the Chuck Bullock answer, and again, <laughs> I was one of Chuck's first public, political science students here at Georgia when he first came to teach. Uh, you know, the Chuck Bullock answer, and I agree with it, Chuck's right, is that for a long time, the Georgia Democrats were able to separate themselves from the National Democrats. They were able to persuade people, you know, you can go ahead and vote for Barry Goldwater or uh, Gerald Ford or uh, Ronald Reagan or whoever you want to, but you can still vote for a Democrat for local office. And they were able to perpetuate that mindset for a long, long time. And I think that more than anything else would account for it. Uh, an interesting factoid for your people that like factoids, Georgia is the only state that did not have a Republican governor, not one in the 20th century, mm -hmm. the entire 20th century. From Rufus Bullock to Sonny Perdue. Correct, 130 yeah. years. So is, is the Chuck Bullock answer the same as the Tom Crawford yeah, answer? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. They also, you know, the Democrats draw the maps mm -hmm. and they were also, especially toward the end of their reign, they were able to do some creative line drawing and, uh, you know, with good line drawing, you can make a 47% share of the vote equal to 52 or 53% share of the vote. Now, I wanna say the Republicans today are even better at line drawing <laughs> than the Democrats were. Because right now, the Democratic baseline vote in the state's probably 43 to 45%. You'll see that just about every statewide race, yet, Republicans control more than 66%, two-thirds of the seats in both the House and the Senate. So that's pretty damn good line drawing. So how were the Republicans able to overcome sort of that cultural inertia, the political mm -hmm. inertia uh, of the Georgia Democrat or the Georgia Democratic Party? Well, it was something that was bound to happen. I mean, it, it, was, it was one of those things and you could see it back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, that it was something that was going to happen at some point. It was, it was all just a matter of when. Because the, the old white Democrats from the rural districts were slowly dying out, and the young people coming up didn't want to be Democrats anymore. They wanted to be Republicans. And uh, in fact, I think that's one reason the Democratic Party still has such a hard time now. It's difficult for them to recruit promising young people to run for office. They all want to be Republicans. Uh, so it was, it was a 
a, a, dem, a demographic inevitability, if you want to put it that way. So d demographics are okay. Well, let's let's jump ahead because I did have a question mm -hmm. about demographics and demographic change. Mm -hmm. Many on the Democratic side pin their hopes on a political resurgence or rebirth uh, mm -hmm. on demographics. Right. Correct. Is that correct? I think Are that's correct? very correct. I mean, that is that is what I've been hearing for the last six or eight years now. That George, <coughs> excuse me, mm -hmm. George is on its way to being a purple state. We've got the, and it's true. Every year, the percentage of white voters goes down by mm -hmm. about a point, and that point is replaced by basically blacks, Latinos, other um, immigrant groups, if you will. And you would think that. Um, at some point, the lines intersect and Democrats are going to take, take over the show again, but I'm not so sure. I, one of the points I've made in some of my columns is that Georgia isn't so much a red state or a purple state, it's a white state. Because the, the more the percentage of the white vote shrinks, the more determined those white voters are to get out, get to the polls, and vote. That's why the Republicans stay in power. Their people vote, Democratic people don't. So I, th I think if we look back at, um, as you said, you know, the white vote in 2016, Hillary Clinton uh, received roughly 20% mm -hmm. of the white vote. Mm -hmm. Th it's going to be pretty hard for Democrats to win regardless of how, how much they can, they can turn out or juice minority uh, mm -hmm. voter and turnout. How do Democrats appeal to white voters? Can they? You know, I'm not sure they can anymore. Uh, the country right now is so polarized, not only politically, but racially. I'm just not sure the white votes are there to get anymore. 20% may turn out to be as, as good as they can do. <coughs> and you're going to have to, uh, it'll be a long time before the percentage of white voters drops low enough for that to make it possible for you to win a statewide race. So we've talked about the Maddox faction, the Jimmy Carter faction, mm -hmm. and the Democratic Party. Do those uh, factions obviously persist in both parties? Where do you, you know, how do you see the lay of the land in both the parties? Mm -hmm. What are the Democratic factions? Well, in a very, very small minority party. Let, let, that me, go, it is. let me go back to what you just sure. mentioned the, the, the Maddox faction and the Carter Absol faction back in the 1970s. Tell us how we got session. here. Basically, the the Maddox faction eventually became Republicans. The Carter faction stayed Democrats. Mm -hmm. And that's really been how the state's uh, political schism has been ever since. It all goes back to the Carter faction versus the Maddox faction. Over the years, the Maddox faction transmogrified or transformed itself into Republicans uh, because they were mostly conservative white folks from rural Georgia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and today, you know, if you look at the uh, look at the look at the picture books of people in the Senate and of the statewide elected officials, they're just about all white males. And you think, in a state with this many, with this higher percentage of black voters and Latino voters and non-white voters, how can that be? Mm -hmm. But again, it goes back to what I said: white folks will get out and vote, and and the others don't, and that makes all the difference in the world. Now. Maybe in 2018, if there's a backlash against Donald Trump, we see a slight lowering on one side and a slight incline on the other side. Maybe that makes a difference. I don't know. I certainly wouldn't bet my next paycheck on it. <laughs> so with, with, with Donald Trump, and, and we'll come back to, to, to you mm -hmm. know, factions in 2018. I think that's maybe a better way mm -hmm. um, to discuss it. The backlash to, to, to President Trump in the 6th District. Mm-hmm. Give us your assessment of that, that Ossoff versus the field versus handle race. What do you think? Is, is there a lasting significance to it? Or was that just you know, sort of a, a primal sc scream against well, the 2016 it, results? You have, to, you have to start with this. The fact that a Democrat, especially an unknown Democrat who had never run for office before, mm -hmm. got 48% of the vote in that district, that's amazing. I mean, that is absolutely astounding because that, is, uh, that was drawn to be basically a 65-35 Republican district. Uh, <coughs> my assessment of the race is, is that Ossoff, with all the money he had, and he had a potload of money, he probably uh, 
pulled out as many white voter, or I'm sorry, as many Democratic voters as it was possible to pull out. The only problem was, as I say, they ran out of Democrats in the runoff. <laughs> and I think the, all of the Ossoff commercials that you saw running over and over and over again, uh, I think in the end had the effect of prompting just enough Republicans to come out and give Karen Handel that 52 to 48 victory in the end. Uh, I think one of Ossoff's people said afterwards, we just ran out of Democrats. And that's probably as good an assessment as any. Do you think any Republican, an, an empty suit running as a Republican, could hold the Georgia 6th District? I think so, yeah. Uh, unless, again, they change the boundaries. What about the 7th District, Rob Woodall? 7th District, that's a little more problematic. Um, for I which think, side? For I mean, for the Republicans. Okay. I mean, certainly, if you're a Democrat and you're looking for a district to try to make a breakthrough in, I would say that's much more likely than the 6th District. But then again, in the 6th District, they did 48% of the vote, which I still find amazing. So 7th District, <coughs> a little bit better uh, terrain to fight on, if you will, but I suspect Woodall will still wind up getting reelected. What makes the 7th better for Democrats? Is, is it the, the demographics of Gwinnett County. It's, it's the demographics of Gwinnett. Gwinnett makes up the heart of that district, and you know it's now a majority minority county, which which is another. You haven't seen the effects of it yet, but that's another really major turning point, I think, in Georgia politics. Okay, yeah, let, let's talk about that because you have the city of Atlanta, mm -hmm. and then the metro area. In the 1970s, 80s, the metro, metro metropolitan Atlanta, the donut really becomes the heartland of Repu modern republicanism mm -hmm. in Georgia. The metro area has sort of split with the southern metro and the northern metro. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or the, the older suburbs versus the, the younger, newer suburbs. Mm -hmm. Is that just a, an economic difference, racial difference? Is that going to be a signifier of, of, of political change? Mm -hmm. the, the southern metro, the diverse mm -hmm counties versus the others? Well, that's that's a product of race, obviously, because the southern, you know, Clayton County now mm -hmm. has become very heavily black. DeKalb County, especially the southern part, has become very heavily black. Uh, you can see in Henry and Fayette, the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, as, as the black population becomes more, uh, becomes denser in the northern reaches of that county, they're going to change too. So that's, I think, largely a product of race there. Okay, so with you know, we're talking about rewriting districts and, and everything like that. Uh, the Republicans have a chance to sort of lock in their majority mm -hmm. in government. What are the, what's the greatest danger to the Republican majority in this state? What what can Republicans do that would actually imperil their majority beyond demographic change? Well, there has always in Georgia and other, is any other state too, you always have a certain level of political corruption. The one thing I think that could trip up Republicans in Georgia would be if, I mean, it would take a Democratic president to do this, obviously, but if you had a Democratic U.S. attorney in Atlanta who really went after corruption and was able to snare several of the top Republicans in indictments or something, that could be uh, something that really becomes a game changer there. Other than that, I don't see anything tripping them up for a few election cycles. Okay, so you know, we're, we're talking about you know, the Republicans firmly in control of state mm -hmm. government. Yes. What are the top priorities for the Republican party? Party individual party members might differ from the party mm -hmm. leadership and, and do, but what are some of the core Republican priorities that, that the party mm -hmm. has um, implemented and might implement in, in the years to come? Well, one of their major goals, and they've, you know, they've made no secret of that, is they want to do away with the state income tax. Now, as people like Nathan Deal, folks who, who have common sense, have, no, have noted, you can't really do that because that's your, that accounts for more than 50% of your state revenues, and without the state income tax, you really don't have a state government anymore <laughs> because you don't have money to run it. But that is the uh, the goal of a lot of the more conservative Republicans, especially in, in the legislature. And uh, <coughs> you have to hope that the adults stay in charge for a while so that the kids in the, <laughs> don't wreck the house with their playing. 
this might be a dangerous follow. Who who are the adults in well, the Republican like, Party? People like Nathan Deal, uh, David Ralston, Jack Hill, the uh, appropriations chairman in the Senate. Uh, Terry England, who's the appropriations chairman in the House, strikes has always struck me as a very level-headed guy. Uh, more conservative, of course, but uh, basically the leadership, you hope, will, will, will at least have enough common sense uh, to keep the kids from wrecking the house there. Is there much political uh, difference between the Republican leadership now and the Democratic leadership back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s? In terms of policy and issues, probably not much, because as you know, back in those days, the Democrats were much more conservative. Uh, what few Republicans there were, some of them were actually very moderate. So no, I'd say really not that much difference. So the, the Republicans make a really strong play for, for leadership, or maybe not leadership, mm -hmm. competitiveness in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that fuel and that energy came from the so-called Christian right. Or, right. or, or the culture wars of the, the late yep. 80s and 90s. How did that reshape the Republican Party? And does it continue to, to shape socially mm. and culturally the party? Well, it did reshape the party and it, it was a major factor. My knowledge about that isn't that good. Okay. Now, I know you're going to be interviewing Jim Galloway. Jim knows that bottom to top, inside and out. He could probably answer that question better than I can. Okay, well, currently, I, I, there are some divisions between, say, the, the grown-ups mm -hmm. and the kids, as you say, over right. issues like religious liberty, for example. Yes. Um, do you foresee that being a lingering mm -hmm. issue? That's going to keep coming up, uh, especially with uh, the ascent of Donald Trump to the White House. You're going to see basically a lot of the, the Trump folks, if you will, bringing that back up. We're going to, it's going to be a major issue in the upcoming session of the General Assembly, and it will continue to be. Uh, and who knows? Maybe at some point Nathan Deal just finally agrees to sign it, like he did with uh, the gun law mm -hmm. that allows guns on a beautiful campus like the University of Georgia. Why? Why the resistance from, from the Republican leadership? I think it's just common sense. I mean, they know those are nutty ideas, and they have a more business orientation as opposed to the social issues orientation you see down in the ranks, and they know it's bad for business. It's just bad for business. At getting rid of the state income tax, as I mentioned earlier, that wrecks your whole budget and makes you unable to run a state government. Bad for business. Back in the 40s, I believe it was the 40s, possibly the 50s, um, Calvin Keitel, James McKay write a book called Who Runs Georgia? I read it. Excellent book. P probably, probably read it in one of Dr. Bullock's No, classes. I read it a little more recently than that, but okay. it's, it's, it, it, I would recommend it to any serious student of politics in Georgia. It's, it's an excellent book. So, okay, for, for people who haven't read it, like, like political mm -hmm. junkies like us, mm -hmm. what were those findings of Keitel uh, and McKay, and how, how do they, uh, are they still relevant today? <laughs> One in particular is very much relevant. They discovered back then that I, one of the most powerful pol political entities in the state was Georgia Power, and that is still true today. That has been, if there's been any one constant in Georgia politics over the years, it is that Georgia Power, by golly, is going to run things and they're going to get what they want from the legislature. And that was as true when Calvin Keitel and Jimmy Mackey wrote that book then as it is today. <coughs> Back then, of course, there was a, the big issue was the county unit system, which gave much more power to rural Georgia than it did to, uh, to the urban parts of the state. And that, I, th I remember that's one of the major themes of their book. That really doesn't matter today. It's not an issue today because uh, was it Baker v. Carr did away mm -hmm. with basically with the county unit system, one man, one vote, one person, one vote. So that's not as much of a, well, it's not any, any of a factor today. But, you, you know, you still have that rough split between conservatives in rural Georgia and the more moderate folks in, in urban Georgia. Back in the, the 1980s, the, the big controversy was the two Georgias. Mm-hmm. Do we have two Georgias still? Do we have more than two Georgias 
Well, we have at least two. Some can make a good argument for three or four or five, but uh, we can all see the handwriting on the wall. Rural Georgia is dying out. Uh, you know, that's why you see so many hospitals around the state closing. And, uh, you know, the, the kids that go to high school in rural Georgia, as soon as they get out of college or whatever, they leave home to find a job. So as rural Georgia passes, not they won't completely pass away, but as it wanes, the cities and the suburbs just, you know, soak up that much more power. Uh, I think Metro Atlanta now has half the population of the state in it. So, you know, we talk, talked about rural rural Georgia dying out, um, or rural America. I, I guess. Rural America, you, you, for you that could matter. Make, you could extend the argument. Is there are there any policies that can reverse or halt, or is that just political fodder for for or rhetoric for for campaigns? I'm not sure there's anything that could reverse it, but I do know this. Uh, in 2013 when Georgia had the opportunity to participate in the Medicaid expansion of sure. the Affordable Care Act. Nathan Deal and David Ralston and the entire, all the Republicans in general assembly said, absolutely not. We're not going to have anything to do with it. We're not even going to run a state exchange. In fact, you had the insurance commissioner, Ralph Hudgens, vowing that he was going to destroy Obamacare. He said, we're going to do everything in our power to obstruct it. So, in 2014 and in 2015 and in 2016, Georgia, each of those years, gave up more than $3 billion in federal money it would have gotten to expand Medicaid coverage. If that money had been coming into Georgia, I would tell you, without fear of contradiction, that the seven or eight rural hospitals that have closed over the last few years would not have closed because there would have been money coming in to pay for indigent care, to pay for Medicaid folks who couldn't afford anything but to go to the emergency room or the hospital. So if Georgia had taken what I would think would be the correct path on expanding Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act, the rural areas would be in a little bit better shape today than they are. Now, it might have been just a temporary reprieve. I mean, I think we can, again, we, demography is destiny and we can see how the demographic trends are going. So long as Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act rem remains in place. Mm -hmm. Does Georgia ever expand Medicaid? Like like more more Democratic well, and, and some Republican states have quite a few uh, Republican quite a few states, Republican a few. states, including Chris Christie in New Jersey and Jan Brewer in Arizona, two people that hated Barack Obama, but they said, "Hey, we can't turn up those federal dollars." <laughs> uh, I think at some point, especially now that Tom Price, who's a Georgian, is in charge of Health and Human Services. <laughs> they will probably cobble together some kind of waiver plan that will allow them to accept Obamacare dollars, but they'll be able to claim at the same time, well, this isn't really Obamacare, so it's okay. That'll be what you see happen, I think. Okay, so 2018, um, we have an election coming up. Um, give me the lay of the land for each party. Mm -hmm. you know, where, what are the fault lines? Um, what are your predictions if you, if you want to hazard a guess? Mm -hmm. um, so let, let's begin with the Republican side. Sure. Well, we have, there will, there will of course be more fringe candidates coming in, but really the Republican side is Casey Cagle, the go Lieutenant Governor, Secretary of State Brian Kemp, uh, State Senator Hunter Hill, State Senator Michael Williams. Am I missing anybody? I think that's it. You may have one or two late late entrance into the race, but those are your four major mm -hmm. ones. Michael Williams, I consider a fringe candidate. He uh, He's raised more than a million dollars, but a million of that came out of his own bank account. So what's the old saying goes, if, if you're not, if you can't find other folks who are willing to finance your campaign, that's a sign your campaign's not going very, very much. Hunter Hill, very conservative guy. He'll try to run to the right of everybody, but again, I consider him a minor candidate. It really comes down to a battle between Casey Cagle and Brian Kemp, where Cagle will be, whether he admits it or not, the more moderate business-oriented candidate, and Kemp's going to run as far to the right as he can, going appealing for that Trump vote. So there, there are your major fault lines on the Republican side, if there are any. Cool. Do, do, you, do you think that establishment tag uh, 
-hmm. however useful or useless that mm -hmm. tag is. Do you think that is more of a, a boon to Casey Cagle or a detriment in, in these sort of post-Trump or, or, or? Well, it's, it's good if you're in a general election. It's not so good if you're in a primary. Oh, okay. And it could certainly cause him trouble in the primary. Um, I mean, it, who knows a year and 15 mm -hmm. months out or whatever from the, um, actually not that far, less than a year from the primary. <coughs> who knows? I mean, Casey Cagle right now is the front runner. I see Brian Kemp trailing behind him. But politics being what it is, you know, if, if a Brian Kemp can find an issue that really ignites the electorate, sometimes that's all you need. And on the Democratic side, it seems to be the, the two Stacys. The two Stacys, wow. right. One black, one white. Uh, the black Stacy, Stacey Abrams, is running a, more of a nationally oriented campaign. Most of her money has come from outside the state of mm -hmm. Georgia, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that at all. But she wants to heighten the party's appeal to blacks and minorities. Stacey Evans, uh, you know, the white Stacey, if you will, really, in my, in my opinion, has been just as progressive a legislator as Stacey Abrams has. There's really not a difference between the two on policy issues. There really isn't, although somebody will try to concoct one. But Stacey still thinks that the party should make some effort to reclaim some of the white, middle-income, working-class voters that have bled over to the Republican Party. I'm not sure that's a viable strategy anymore, but certainly worth a try if you want to take a shot at it. So, in terms of, of demographics, it seems like what you're saying is there just aren't enough white voters for a Stacey Evans strategy to be successful. In, Maybe, a, in a Democratic primary. that Probably right. Now, you know, as we know, in Democratic primaries now, more than half your voters are non-whites, with mostly blacks, some Latinos. Um, so a Stacey Abrams is better set up to win a primary election. A Stacey Evans is in better shape to run a general election. So that's the conundrum that the Democratic Party is caught in right now, that the which is, of course, has been, a, in, a, in a different way, has been a, a problem for Republican parties in a lot of states. But the person who's better equipped to win the primary, in this case, is not the person who's better equipped to run in a general election. So can the, can the Democrats get over that hurdle? I don't know. I'm not sure that they can. And, and it seems, you know, that's, you know, to, to sort of buy into the, the argument that you're saying is you know, the biggest stumbling block to a democratic resurgence is simply there hasn't been enough Democrat, demographic change, yes. excuse me. Yes, it hasn't happened fast enough. Okay, so let's switch gears and look at the, the, the Georgia legislature. What are the key issues that, that Republicans and Democrats can actually work together on? Or at least some Democrats and some Republicans, or, or vice versa. The, the truth of the matter is they agree on more issues than they disagree. Because most of the stuff that passes through there is fairly routine, uh, what we call house cleaning legislation that they have to pass every year. In recent years, even on the budget, they've been per even the budget now usually passes by a, a unanimous vote in both the House and the Senate. It really is when you get down to maybe social issues, racial issues, that, that you see a difference. Gun control was one. Religious liberty was another. Uh, certainly voter suppression, voter registration, those things. But the fact of the matter is on most of the issues, most of which are pretty humdrum issues, like the state budget, there's not, a much, there's not much difference between them these days, really. Um, transportation. Mm -hmm. um, transportation spending, um, you know, the future of, you know, we, we talked about how Atlanta now has, Metro Atlanta now has 50% of, of the you know, state's population. Mm -hmm. is, is there a political solution to Atlanta traffic? Well, I think you have seen a turnaround there among the Republican leadership, and they, there's now a recognition that that you can't build yourself out of, out of a, you can't pave yourself out of a traffic congestion. It's going to take more, more transit. And it took a long time for them to admit that. Deep inside they knew it, but it's only in the last couple or three years that they've publicly admitted 
and said, yeah, we've got to do something about transit. So that is one issue in which I allow, I allow myself to be a little bit optimistic that maybe they'll do the smart thing here <laughs> and, and, and get not just Atlanta, but the rest of the state on a better track. It's, it sounds like roughly there's a, a sort of pro-business, pro-growth, mm -hmm. smart, I don't know if it goes smart so far growth, to say smart, smart growth. Well, pro-growth, certainly pro-growth. Uh, what has kept Georgia from sort of devolving into the political chaos that is like North Carolina mm -hmm. or Louisiana, Kansas economically? I think we've just been lucky uh, more than anything else mm -hmm. because uh, you know, you could have had, say, a more conservative, a more socially conservative person get elected speaker than David Ralston did, and mm -hmm. we'd be talking about an entirely different state now if that had been the case. So it might be the luck of the draw more than anything else. So do you, do you think the speaker, uh, the speaker's power, Speaker Ralston's power, is anywhere near what it was when Tom Murphy sure. had the gavel? Mm -hmm. You do. It, it, it was then and it remains today one of the most powerful positions in state government, second only to the governor, I would, I would argue. Why is that? With, with all the, the, the change in terms of you know, party switchover, mm -hmm. new faces, um, people coming from new places in Georgia, that the power of the speaker remains what it was in, in the, the mid-last mm -hmm. mid century. Well, a lot of that is a, is a quirk of the Georgia Constitution and it like the U.S. Constitution, it says all tax bills, revenue bills, budget bills originate in the House. That gives you a built-in advantage right there. Uh, you know, that you've got more House members, which means you've got more of a network out in the state supporting you, and that makes a big difference right there, too. And uh, it is, um, the power of the Speaker became what it is today when, uh, when Lester Maddox was elected governor and he agreed in return for the legislature electing him governor, he agreed to let the speaker and to let the House determine their own committee chairs, their own committee chairman. That's when you saw, that's when you saw the modern speaker position created and it has been a very powerful position ever since. What, what is it, um, what sort of attributes, uh, outlook, you know, demeanor, makes for a successful politician in Georgia? Statewide, congressionally, mm -hmm. Senate-wise? I, um, I like to compare it to uh, George W. Bush, who certainly I think history will show to have been one of our worst presidents, <laughs> although there are other contenders of that one coming up all the time, aren't there? But people always said, well, you know, he's not very smart and he can be pretty mean sometimes, but he's someone you'd like to have a beer with. And <laughs> I think that that glad-handing frat boy attitude still counts for a lot in, in politics today, especially in Georgia politics. That's why you see a lot of people who were once University of Georgia fraternity members who go out, get elected to the legislature, become governor. It's that same. Well, they've in fact, the, the General Assembly session itself has been described as just one big frat party every <laughs> year where people come, drink, chase women in some cases, and just have a lot of fun while they're in the big city away from home. Not, there's no Henry Grady uh, no hotel Henry, anymore. There's not a Henry Grady hotel anymore, but you know, they find their own ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, somebody who I don't, I don't think of as, as Maybe I'm wrong in, in don't thinking of the frat boy culture and stuff. It seems to me Johnny Isaacson has had one of the more interesting political mm -hmm. trajectories, um, going from a relatively centrist Republican from from Cobb County, very moderate, very rational Republican. Yes, to yeah. went through sort of the the crucible of the 1990s. It yeah. sure. ends up in the United States Senate, sort of against mm -hmm. you know all all odds. But he, but he himself swerved very hard to the right, too, in the process of doing that, uh, which happened to all Republicans, really, in Georgia. Paul, you know, Paul Coverdell, a very moderate state senator back in the 70s, but became a very hard right U.S. senator in the early 90s, and same with Johnny Isaacson. Uh, 
he votes for things now that I don't think he ever would have voted for when he was a young man coming up in the early 70s. Do you think, since, since we talked about older politicians, Paul Coverdell, his, re, his replacement after mm -hmm. his untimely um, death, Zell Miller, former Zell governor Miller. Zell Miller, mm -hmm. can the Democratic Party of Georgia produce Zell Millers anymore, or is that a bygone era? Mm. Well, I think if Stacey Evans could win the Democratic primary, she'd almost be a female Zell Miller. In a, and I mean that not in a negative sense, but in a positive sure, sense. Sure, sure. She's from North Georgia. Mm -hmm. She came from a hard scrabble, working class background in North Georgia. And uh, a lot of similarities in her life story and Zell's life story. Uh, I don't think she would zigzag so much on the issues that she would get the nickname Zigzag Zell. But I think she would have the potential maybe to be a female Zell Miller. Because, again, that same life story and which gave her a lot of empathy, gives her a lot of empathy, I think, for, for folks who are, who are struggling to make it in this time. Since we're on, on the issue of Zell Miller and Stacey Evans, the Hope Scholarship, mm -hmm. how do, does it remain? Uh, how, how is it going to, to, to change? And how has it changed maybe sort of the, the political lay of the land, mm -hmm. such a relatively major you know, mm -hmm. government intervention in a large segment of the economy. Yeah. Well, of course, that's what made Zell Miller's reputation, and it's the one thing he'll be remembered for, I guess, longer than anything else. And it's, it's a good program. It's enabled a lot of kids, like Stacy Evans, to go to college, that, who, whose families had never had anybody go to college sure. before. So it's a good thing in that respect. Uh, and it's, as you know, because so many kids get it now, it does not cover as many of the expenses as it once did, and it doesn't cover as much of the tuition as it once did, but it's still a very, it's a good program to have, and it is the very, a, a real untouchable program in, in state government, th the third rail, if you will, because while they fiddled with the benefits that it pays, and while they've reduced some of the benefits that it pays, anybody who ever tried to do away with a HOPE scholarship would find themselves voted out of office in the next election. Do you ever think that that sort of acceptance of a major government program like that will ever expand beyond a sort of middle class entitlement like Hope Scholarship into other areas of government intervention or government spending? <clears throat> well, maybe, probably not, and for this reason, when a program has been around as long as the Hope Scholarship or Social Security or Medicare, People don't even associate it with a government program anymore. That's just something that's always been there and they've always been entitled to it. Uh, I like the, the story Saxby Chambliss uh, told about his mother, you know, saying, keep the government's hands off my Medicare. And once a program reaches that status, it's, it's not really a government program anymore. It's just something you're going to get, by golly, because it's always been there and you're entitled to it. Uh, that's why... I, as good, as good a program as the HOPE Scholarship has been, I, I'm not sure you could see it replicated in similar governor pro, government programs that would provide some help or assistance to, to middle-income and low-income families. Um, just don't know that the political will is there to do that. Okay, say, you started the, the Georgia Report 18 years ago? Yeah, so, uh, January 2000. January 2000. So the first governor's rate. Let's look at 2002. Okay. How, how and why does Roy Barnes lose to the, a Republican for the first time since Reconstruction? Well, the popular explanation is that, well, Roy tried to do too much in his first term. There's a lot of truth to that, but he alienated not just the Confederate flag waivers, but he, he alienated the teachers with his education reform. And there were some other people he he also made mad because of sort of a little bit, maybe the arrogance of his administration. But basically when you throw in the, the change in the state flag and his uh, attempt to blame Georgia's education problems on the teachers, that did him in more than anything else. Because in every county in Georgia, you had teachers and school principals and administrators saying, Roy Barnes is a terrible person, let me tell you why. And, and that, did him in probably more than anything else right there. 
And on the Republican side, do you think it, there was uh, Sonny Perdue, Sonny obviously, Perdue. went on to win, uh, but also Bill Byrne, Bill Byrne of Cobb County and Linda Shrinko, the, mm -hmm. the state school superintendent right. from Columbia County. If Sonny Perdue doesn't win that primary, does Roy Barnes survive, in your opinion? Maybe, but it's just as likely that he might have lost anyway. So in a, in a way, we're lucky that the Republicans nominated Sonny Perdue instead of Linda Shrinko. <laughs> Why's that? Well, she was a crook. She was stealing federal funds while all this was going on to run her campaign. Bill Byrne, not crooked or corrupt, but just a really ill-tempered, hot-headed ex-Marine. He wouldn't have been a good governor either. Uh, we were lucky that the best of the three alternatives was the one who wound up getting the Republican nomination because probably whoever had the Republican nomination would have been in a pretty good position to win that year. More than anything else, that Sonny Perdue will tell you, well, God, it, God wanted me to win. No, Sonny was just in the right place at the right time. There's a Senate race also that year um, with the incumbent Democrat Max right. Cleland. Um, ends up running against Saxby Chambliss, right. Congressman Saxby Chambliss from Deep South Georgia, yeah. mm -hmm. who defeated Bob Irvin, a Metro Republican, sort mm -hmm. of signifying a, a, a geographic change or shift in, in sort of the, the base mm -hmm. of the Republican Party. Why, why was, was Max Cleland also ousted in, a, in, in 2002? <sighs> Well, you had a, a general surge for the Republicans that year because of George W. Bush. Sure. Yeah. You had also the dynamics of the governor's race, which I suspect would have pushed a few more Republican voters over from Saxby Chambliss's column in the Senate race as well. Uh, Max didn't run a very good campaign, and he should have he should have spoke up when when uh, Saxby Chambliss ran some of those commercials against him, comparing him to Osama bin Laden and he didn't, and that made a lot of people perceive him as weak. I mean, he had his own physical issues, as we all know, but Max should have stood, no, I can't say should have stood up for himself, sorry. Max should have spoke up for himself, and he should have told Saxby, what you've done is the most despicable thing I've ever seen in politics, because it was. It was really a despicable ad, but he didn't let, he didn't say anything. He let Saxby get in those punches against him unmolested, and that, had a lot to do with him losing, I think. Do you think a lot of people, or, or many voters, I suppose, ex voted for Saxby, or excuse me, voted for Max Cleland in 1996, mm -hmm. expecting another Sam Nunn? Yeah, po possibly so, because you know Max was a veteran, and uh, he had he was cons he was thought to be you know a moderate to conserve slightly conservative Democrat like Sam Nunn was. He turned out to be a little more liberal than that, but yeah, I think there was maybe that expectation. Okay, so so moving moving ahead, you know, it, 2002 is pretty much a, it's a very it's a shock. I shouldn't say pretty oh, yeah. much, it it, was, it, especially was a the governor's cataclysmic race. shock. No question about it. Um, why do you think that was the catalyst for sort of realignment down down ballot? Certainly, it was. Yeah, because. Uh, in that same election, of course, the voters elected a majority of the Democrats in the House and the Senate, but in the Senate it was just a 30 to 26 margin. There were a couple of Democrats who in a normal election year probably would have been reelected, but they lost. Mm -hmm. And that got the margin close enough where Sonny and his friends were able to persuade four people to change parties, and that flipped the Senate. And then, of course, in 2004, Republicans won a majority of the Senate on their own volition. But yeah, that was really, uh, once the first cracks in the foundation appeared, the whole house tumbled down pretty quickly. So you know, with 2006, um, and then I guess each gubernatorial election up, up through, um, the mm. Democrats haven't really been able to muster mm -hmm. much of a challenge. Um, do you think that'll change? Um, well, not anytime soon. Uh, and again, I can't really make a prediction for next year's governor's race because I don't know how this schism within the Democratic Party is going to work itself out between the two Stacys. Uh, 
it could completely wreck the party or they may find a way of finessing it so it strengthens their candidate. I just don't know. Best case, you might have the Democrat getting 46, 47 percent of the vote in the governor's race next year. Worst case, maybe they drop back towards 40 again. Saxby Chambliss retired in 2014. Correct. That primary election was sort of, the Republican primary was interesting. Mm, very interesting. That, walk, walk us through that primary and how we got to you know, David Perdue versus uh, uh, Michelle Nunn. Well, the, the primary, there were a bunch of people in the primary, but your three major candidates were uh, David Perdue, Jack Kingston, and Karen Handel. You also had, who was it? Uh, oh, Lord. Paul Brown. Paul Brown and uh, Cobb, Phil, uh, Phil Gingrich mm -hmm. from Cobb County. But they both really wound up not being much of a factor. It, it came down to those three candidates, Karen Handel, David Perdue, Jack Kingston, and which two would get in the runoff. And as we know, Karen Handel was one who got squeezed out. Uh, once the runoff was here, all the Republican establishment lined itself up between behind Jack Kingston. And, and this was the race that taught me that political endorsements don't really mean a thing because Jack <laughs> Kingston was endorsed by everybody in the book that you could think of, and David Perdue wasn't, and David Perdue beat him. I completely skipped over um, 2010 with, um, with, with Governor Deal. And Roy um, Barnes. And Roy Barnes. It, it wasn't likely that, it didn't seem likely that Nathan Deal was going to win that Republican primary. How, how does Nathan Deal come out uh, as the Republican nominee in 2010? God, I've got to th I'm, I'm going to have to think back on that. I, it's second. my fault jumping around yeah. from, from years and everything like that. Let me that. think. It was, oh, Nathan Deal, that's right, it was Nathan Deal, it was John Oxendine, it was Eric Johnson. Um, Karen Handel as well. Karen Handel, thank you. How could I forget Karen Handel? But if you remember when that race started out, the perceived front runner, the conventional wisdom was that it was going to be John Oxendine. Um, but because he was pretty much a silly goof and had been a complete <laughs> disaster as insurance commissioner, or had not done a very good job as insurance commissioner, he fell pretty quickly. Uh, Eric Johnson was well, an interesting race. There was also a legislator from the Brunswick area. What was his? Jeff. Chapman. Jeff Chapman was also running. He got into the governor's race primarily because Eric Johnson and the Senate leadership had treated him like dirt. If Eric Johnson had been nicer to Jeff Chapman, Jeff might not have run for governor. The votes that went for Jeff Chapman, which were primarily in the coastal area, would have gone to Eric Johnson, and it might have been Eric Johnson in that runoff instead of Nathan Deal. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the great what-ifs of Georgia politics there. But it was Nathan Deal and Karen Handel in the runoff, and the conventional wisdom again. The conventional wisdom had once been, well, it's going to be John Oxendine. Then it became, well, it's going to be Karen Handel because, you know, uh, Sarah Palin's going to come to Georgia and do this big event for her. And all the Sonny Purdue people, of course, were on Karen's side and helping her raise money. And, uh, you know, the Republican establishment, such as it was. So you, everybody thought, well, it's, it's certainly, obviously, it's going to be Karen Handel. Who else would it be? But Nathan hung in there and was persistent. And, you know, like a fighter who just keeps slugging his way through 15 rounds was the one who was still standing at the end. How was Governor Deal able to overcome the not insignificant concerns and, and press attention uh, mm -hmm. given to, to his ethics, perceived ethics violations, accused ethics violations. Well, he, here's another great what if of Georgia politics. If you remember all of the bad stories about Nathan Deal and his financial problems, if you remember at one point it looked like he was going to be three weeks away from having to declare for public bankruptcy when he was sworn in as governor. His, his personal financial status was in such bad shape. That didn't hit until the fall, once the primary was over. I have always argued that if Karen Handel had used her money on good opposition researchers instead of 
spending $100,000 on an event for uh, Sarah Palin, if she, had, if she had done some decent opposition research and spent the money on that, they would have uncovered Nathan Deal's financial problems before the primary and before the runoff. And she could have killed him with that, I think. We'll never know for sure, and I'm sure Brian Robinson would agree with me, but decent opposition research for Karen Hanwell, she could have knocked Nathan Deal out right there in the runoff, maybe even in the primary. Do you think uh, Senator Johnson would have been able to, to overcome Karen Handel the way Nathan Deal did? Possibly. That, that's a real possibility. Because uh, I think uh, Karen Handel had a big handicap in the fact that she was a woman, and it's still that time, maybe less so now, still difficult for a woman to be taken seriously as a statewide candidate in the Republican primary. Okay, so but now that the time we're talking, 2017, mm -hmm. the Republican Party in Georgia has been in charge of the governor's mansion for 14 going on 15 years, mm -hmm. the legislature for a dozen or so years, quite a stable of veteran politicians. Who are some of the future prospects, the future leaders or stars of the, of the Georgia Republican Party? Hmm. You know, I hadn't thought about it in... in in that respect, uh, let's turn off the turn off the camera. Let me give some thought to that. I okay. Don't want to... okay. So we were talking about the future mm -hmm. prospects, the future Republican bench. Um, mm -hmm. Your your thoughts on that? Well, the the most likely uh, members of the bench to move up are always your people in Congress, and you know the Republicans. I think what control ten of the fourteen seats in Congress. So, you know, look. They, they go the, uh, the spectrum from Jody Heiss and Doug Collins and Tom Graves and Barry Loudermilk way, way out here on the right. And then somewhat closer in, you have people like Austin Scott or, or Buddy Carter or Rick Allen, who somewhat, somewhat more moderate, although they would argue, oh, no, we're all staunch conservatives. Uh, I don't know what was the joke somebody said. There are two factions of Republicans in the legislature, the far right and the far, far right. <laughs> and I think maybe that describes some of the folks in, in Congress. But you're likely to see some of those folks move up. And in your statewide elected offices, we've seen Brian Kemp try to make the move up to run for governor. You've seen Casey Cagle make the move up to run for lieutenant governor. Maybe someone like Agriculture Commissioner Gary Black. I can see Gary running for governor one day. He you know, he has that, again, that good old backslapping frat boy type of demeanor to him, and, and that would be something I could see him running for. What about the, the beleaguered Georgia Democratic Party? Well, the Democrats uh, have suffered so many losses over the years, they don't have much of a bench left. Uh, there are four members of Congress, uh, all of them are African Americans, and all of them, I think, probably over the age of 60 or 65 now, except... Well, they're all they're all older black men. I can't see any of them stepping out and running uh, for, for for statewide office. But certainly, Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed, uh, he's a, he could be an attractive candidate at some at some time. Uh, depending on which of the Stacys wins the the nomination next year, maybe the other one would still have a political future of some sort if they don't destroy each other in a, in a nuclear blast, which is also equally possible. Since you brought up uh, Kasim Reed, who, who's mm -hmm. not running for re-election. He's running had for his, his two terms. Um, you have what's shaping up to be a very nasty race in Atlanta right. for, for the mayor race. Uh, mayoral race between sort of the the left mm -hmm. and, and the far left of the Democratic Party, but or then, would you, would you but describe you it differently? I would describe it differently okay. because the front runner in the Atlanta mayoral race is Mary Norwood, who is a Republican, a white Republican, and she's got well, she's leading in the polls right now, but that's with thirty percent, so that's not going to give you a majority. But it's uh, the, the the runoff is likely to be, to be between Mary Norwood, who. A white Republican, although she's a very moderate, you a know, buckhead Republican. Buckhead Republican, you know, living in the city of Atlanta, you can't be too far out there. But the runoff's going to be between Mary Norwood and one of the black candidates running. So, it could become a really ugly racial race, racial 
mayoral race uh, before it's all over, and it'll go to a runoff, and it, it, when, in which case it'll get even uglier. So, not unlike two thousand nine. Yes. Was it two thousand nine. Yeah. Two thousand nine, when Kasim Reed first got elected. Yeah. And Mary Norwood was was in the. And she was in the mix, and she came within seven hundred votes of winning it. Um, so she could, she could be Atlanta's first white mayor since who? Sam Massell. Sam Massell. Back in the early 70s. Right, 1969, 1970. Um, okay, so what's the future of Georgia politics? Where, where, you know, we've talked a little bit about it, the history, the, the present state of Georgia politics. Looking ahead 10, 20 years, how, how would you describe Georgia politics to to somebody like me, 10, mm. 20 years down the road? God, 20, if, if you had to guess. So much can change in 20 years, but let me say, perhaps in 20 years, nobody can know for sure, perhaps in 20 years, the demographics really will have changed enough so that even if you don't have a Democrat as governor, Democrats at least have more than 40 or 45 percent of the seats in the legislature, which would really make this a two-party state. Uh, as I've mentioned to you before, Georgia has always been a one-party state. For 130 years run by the Democrats, you had an interregnum, interregnum of two to four years, but ever since it's been run by the Republicans, a one-party state run by Republicans. It, and I have argued you really need to have two competitive parties just to keep everybody honest. So I would hope that in 20 years the demographics would at least have made it possible for Democrats to be competitive and to make it a true two-party state, if for no other reason than to keep everybody honest. Do you think Democrats will be more competitive statewide before they are competitive down ballot? Right, definitely more competitive statewide. You've, you've really got to get a Democratic governor elected who, if, if nothing else, could veto any gerrymandering uh, redistricting bills that come out of the legislature. Well, Mr. Crawford, is there anything else? My gosh, I think we've covered the waterfront today. <laughs> well, well, I appreciate it. Um, thank you for participating in the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Program, uh, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Um, really do appreciate it. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Proud to be here.